This is the Horse Radio Network. This is episode 815 of Horse Tip Daily. A different horse tip, a different equine topic, a different equestrian expert every day. Horse Tip Daily brings the world of equine knowledge to you one day at a time. Greetings, horse people. Coach Jen here, and thanks for tuning in to Horse Tip Daily. Today's tip is a little nod to the Horses in the Morning Show's really bad ads that we chuckle at on Fridays, as Helena B. and Glenn the Geek from Stable Scoop throw out a list of horse buying blunders. And we'll get right to our tip after this shopping tip from Equestrian Collections. Hi, Glenn, here with the Horse Radio Network, and I am with Debbie from Equestrian Collections with the Equestrian Collections Product of the Week. Hi, Glenn. This week I'm featuring a new breech that we have available for a very reasonable price. It's the Equitough line of breeches. They come in full seat. They come in knee patch in the breech style. That's with the zipper. They also come in a pull-on, and they also come in a kid's knee patch pull-on and a kid's pull-on jod. These are very comfortable. They're great for the summer. They're kind of a um, ribbed material, very light, very stretchy. Um, Our size chart, they run a little large, but what that really means is they run a little comfortable. Um, They actually fit. (laughs) Yes, they do. And because they're stretchy, they, um, they will fit differing sizes within the same waist size group. They also um, are uh, just as um, lightweight so that I wear them on the trails now uh, for summer and they're very, very comfortable. And look at the price point. The price is only forty ninety five for the knee patch. The full seat, the full seat now is only fifty four ninety five. And I tried on myself both the knee patch and the full seat, and they both fit comparably. So you don't have to size differently for the full seat uh, than you do the knee patch. Highly recommend these for schooling and for trail riding and for everyday wear. Super comfortable, super light, and super attractive. I like that they have a a bunch of different colors and also come in regulars and longs in almost all the sizes. So that that helps. Yeah, they really, really came out with these to fit everybody for, um, you know, for anything that you want to do. So I highly recommend them. Enjoy mine very much. Right price for some good breeches. It's the Equitoff Ladies Knee Patch Breeches. You can search for them at uh, equestriancollections.com. Just search for Equitoff Breeches, and you'll bring up the whole line there. Or go to uh, our website, and we'll put a link to, to them at, as well. Now, also, I wanted to remind everybody to hop on over to Facebook and follow Equestrian Collections on Facebook. You guys are always posting some cool stuff. So uh, mm-hmm. definitely follow them and become a fan on Facebook. Well, you have been horse shopping what seems like your entire life since I've known you. And, <laughs> and uh, we have certainly done our share of horse shopping, and we bought horses in almost every which way you can over the years. So I found this list. It was on about.com, and it's done by Catherine Blackensdorf, Blackensdorf. And it's the top 10 horse or pony buying mistakes. So you want to hear about these, and we can chat about them a little bit. We'll see which ones we've done. Oh, I want to hear about them. <laughs> All right, here's number one, buying an untrained horse. Many experienced horsemen and women will tell you they see this too often because untrained horses are often cheaper or for whatever other whim, beginner riders will choose untrained horses. Don't buy an untrained horse if you plan to train it yourself and you're inexperienced. Training can take months. It can be dangerous if not done right, blah, blah, blah. So... We certainly have seen this. (laughs) Yes. I mean, I think if you do work with a trainer, it's great. It's a good revenue opportunity for your trainer. (laughs) We call that cash flow in the horse business. But if you don't have a trainer, yeah, leave the untrained horses where you found them. Well, you know, we had a... We had a student one time uh, years ago, when we uh, 20 years ago now, and she was a part-time student of Jennifer's, came once a week or once every other week and took lessons. And then one day she decided to buy herself a horse without telling us. Without even talking to Jennifer about it, she went out and bought a thoroughbred off the track. Went to the track, picked it up, or had it delivered home, went to get on it the first time without 
again, not talking to her trainer. Oh, gosh. A very inexperienced rider. You know, maybe been taking lessons for three or four months. Uh, got on it for the first time. Of course, the thoroughbred promptly threw her off. She broke her neck on the wall that she Oh, jeez. And, uh, you know, oh, she was geez. out of commission for almost a year. Uh, they, obviously, the horse went back the next day, and she never talk, did anything with horses again. You know, it doesn't matter how much you tell people. You know, get help. Don't go look at a horse by yourself. Bring your trainer along. Yeah, it's going to cost you a few dollars, but it's going to save you a lot in the long run. Yeah, I mean, it's an animal. You're sitting on the back of an animal. You know, it's such a simple thing that you you think you would remember or you'd realize, but I guess you don't. Well, you I never know what you're going to get. When you I think do. in her situation, it was like, well, you know, you would have probably told me not to get it. Well, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, that's right. We would have. Yeah. Uh, you know, that's it's, an extreme example, but it's a true example, you know, that happened to us. Well, it's extreme, yes, but not unlikely. Right. It's happened you know, a lot. It's certainly, <laughs> yeah, the, the, the likelihood is pretty high. <laughs> you take, whew, okay. Well, yeah, there you go. <laughs> so that, okay. that, uh, that's number one. Number two, turning down older horses. An older horse who has, been, who has seen the world makes a great beginner horse. Beginners might shy away from the horse that's in their late teens and early 20s. However, many healthy, sound horses can be ridden well into their senior years. You and I personally have both bought older horses. Yes, I think they're amazing. I, they're, they're fabulous. You can't, you can't train experience into a horse, you know, like you can buying an older horse with experience, with wisdom. Maybe I should say that. They have wisdom. They have the wisdom to keep you safe. In well, the they, that's the one thing they tend to want to do, you know, is they, want, they tend to want to keep themselves safe, which is going to keep you safe. Right. Self-preservation. Yeah. That's what I loved about my, the quarter horses that I had. They just, they're all about self-preservation and they were older. They were all, you know, over, well, older, over 12, 14, 15 years old, 17, <laughs> 27. <laughs> Well, when I bought my first driving pony, I didn't know a thing about driving. I barely had ridden. You know, this was after I met Jennifer. And I wanted to do something. And she said, why don't you try driving? So when I bought Piper, my first driving pony and my lifetime pony, uh, she was almost uh, 18. And now we, she died at almost 40. And I drove her into her early 30s. So, you know, she was a terrific pony, and she knew, she just knew, she taught us how to drive. You know, and if I had gotten a youngster that was, you know, three or four years old, we would have had a very sorry experience. And who knows, I may not have been into it at all because of the sorry experience. Right. But because I chose something that was going to teach us, and she had this thing where she threw her head when I do something wrong. And so I knew if I was doing it wrong, I, I just kept changing what I did until she stopped throwing her head. And then I was doing it right. So that she actually taught me how to drive that way. Hmm. Yeah. So, yeah, don't overlook the oldsters. No, no. And they, and they have a lot of years left because, well, you know, it's just like in people. What do they say? Like, you know, 40 is the new 30. Well, in horses, <laughs> 20 is the new 10. I think 50 is the new 30. But, you know. It's true. It's true. I'm going to live to be 103. <laughs> I'm telling you. Uh, three, buying a young horse for children to grow up with. You want to take this one? <laughs> <sighs> buying a young horse for children to grow up with. Well, you know what? Children are going to grow out of first. So that's, that's the first mistake. Yeah. You know, I mean, it, if you, if it's a pony, if it's a pony and you buy something, kids are just going to outgrow it. Well, not but if you that, buy like, they're going to get hurt if it's a youngster that's untrained. Uh, you know, not their first horse. Now I have, you know, we have had situations where kids have, you know, we have teenagers that have been in the extreme Mustang makeover and done very well, but that was not their first horse. You know, they learned on the old safe pony, uh, until, you know, until they got to be a horseman, you know, even at a young age. Right. Well, you know, (laughs) Marion Kennedy has a song for that. It's called green on green makes black and blue. So, Green on green makes black, black on blue. blue. Yep. Black and blue. I mean, there's, <laughs> you know, you c- sorry, I can't find anything. <laughs> I said, I'm trying to like say, okay, well, there's a good, you know, 
maybe there's a reason somebody would do that, like a good reason, but there's nothing. You, you just Well, know. she has a sentence in here. Buy a horse that knows how to handle itself when all the scary aspects of the world present themselves because a young beginner rider won't know how. And that just says it all right there. You yep. want the horse that's going to take care of your kid, not uh, them both uh, die together. So, right. Yeah. Right. Buying at an auction. Let me read this. It takes a keen eye to pull a good horse out of an auction. Horses can appear docile at auction because they are so confused or heavily drugged. Uh, th- I added that. Th- things like heaves and lameness can be hidden easily with drugs. Yes, I would say if you're going by at an auction, we have bought my Piper. Uh, we bought all of my driving ponies have been bought at auctions. Uh, but Jennifer knows what she's looking for. She knows the sign. She knows what to look for. She she knows she knows auction. She knows what they do. She knows the tricks they pull. So, you know, have we been? We have. You know, we bought a horse or two at an auction that uh, we have ended up bringing back to the auction. So, you know, we're we were fooled too. Uh, so you can't always never trust what you see in an auction. Is the general rule. I won't even buy a horse at auction and. You know, I wouldn't I wouldn't even go to an auction without Jennifer. <laughs> but the thing about auctions is that you have to know not just what you're looking at, but what you don't see as well. You yeah. know, you need to have that like that third eye, they say, that intuition that fills in the blanks for you. Um and, you know, I was telling my veterinarian, uh, yeah, I'm down to one horse here at my farm and we're looking for something for Grace. And I thought it would be nice to um, head down to, you know, New Holland or something and pull a pony or a small horse out of the kill pen. And, you know, the one piece of advice he said was just remember that when you get them home and you start to feed them and treat them with love and kindness, you could end up with a completely different horse than the one you found at the auction. And that's not that's drugs aside. What he was really referring to was just the condition, like they're so beat down and they're so the stress and all that stuff that they arrive at the auction house with, you know, they're just so depressed that, you know, not even not even with drugs, they could come back a completely different animal. That is true. So, that's very true, actually. Yep. And that's the same for rescue horses, too. Uh, you, but you, that's not going to stop me. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, rescue horses are that way, too. You really don't know what you're getting because they're not in full you know, they're not they're not uh, fully a horse again until they're fed up and, you know, they got to get to be a horse again. Impulse buying. Don't buy a horse on first sight. Try the horse out. Try it again. Ask lots of questions. Go home and think about it for a few days. Look at other horses besides the one you're smitten with and make comparisons. How many times have we seen this? We used to have our students that, uh, you know, especially teenage girls fall for this one. Ah, adult women do too, where they go and they fall in love. Well, they're falling in love with everyone, let's put it. And they're falling in love with every guy they meet at that age too. So, you know, this, it's not uncommon that this happens, but it, it is something that uh, gets them in trouble. They end up with horses that uh, were not a match. Hmm. Yeah. Well, you know, it's hard. Horses are an emotional purchase. It's it's hard to separate that. Again, this is why it's helpful to bring somebody along who knows what they're doing. Somebody who can be like, uh uh-uh, uh, no. <laughs> right. <laughs> He's bad for you. He's the Johnny Depps of the world. Now, uh, not asking for a trial period. Don't be afraid to ask the seller for a trial period. Most private owners want their horses to go to good homes and are confident about the type of person they feel can handle their horse. Some of them won't let you take the horse away. You have to come to their barn to do it. Um, and, uh, you know, dealers, you can tell a dealer, especially if you're responding to Craigslist ads, because they're the ones that say, oh, nope, you got to take it. I got 25 other people lined up to take this horse. Well, let the other 25 have it. Um, you know, just be careful with that. Uh, and you can spot a dealer a mile away. Yeah. So, uh, buying a horse to breed. Do you want to buy a horse so you can breed it and have a foal? Before you do, visit an auction where horses are destined for rendering or meat. Pay attention to how many look like the result of backyard breeding experiments. Consider if you can live with this outcome for the horse you have brought into the world. Uh, You know, I know you and Jamie both have strong opinions about breeding. So, you want to very strong opinions. You want to take this one? (laughs) Very strong opinions. No, I mean, there's really not too much to be said. You said it all. Like, Go down and stand, go down to a rendering plant or go talk to any of the horse rescue groups. Go see for yourself before you, before, I have a big problem with breeding anything. There's just too many, 
there are too many older horses out there. Right. And there's a lot of fixable problems, too. You know, a lot of people want to breed horses because they want to start fresh. You know, it's like buying a new car versus a used car. You don't want to inherit somebody else's problems or whatever. It's so much less expensive to have some x-rays done or a full veterinary workup than it is to even breed a horse or to put the money into training a horse. Just go get something that's used. Go pull something out of the kill pen and have your vet, you know, spend $900,000. You'd spend way more than that on breeding fees and on purchase prices, and you can get yourself something really nice. Oh, yes, don't breed. Buying a horse that is too much horse. You may envision yourself jumping five feet, uh, concrete culverts on a cross-country event. However, the reality is you've only been riding six months, and you haven't jumped at all. So, uh, you know, probably the high performance uh, sports car uh, when you, with your first car is not a good idea. Every single time the 16 year old will wreck it. So <laughs> that is a good analogy, <laughs> actually. The 16 year old. It's a good analogy, though, isn't it? Your brand new driver always wrecks the sports car. Yep. <laughs> yep. So keep that one in mind. I don't think we have to talk about that one. Buying a horse of a particular color. This is an interesting one. Uh, while it is perfectly reasonable to want a special coat pattern, like with a paint or Palomino or Appaloosa, it's not wise to buy, buy for color only. Don't base your decision on the color if the mind and training aren't suitable. When you're buying a car, the adage is you don't drive the paint. I know your emotion comes out in this one, doesn't it? (laughs) Well, (laughs) no, because I believe in pretty is as pretty does. So yeah, I mean, you've never picked horses really by by looks. You've picked. Oh my god! No, you maybe maybe by confirmation and how I think they might ride. Yeah, but not that they were beautiful, you know, or pretty. No, but when you get there, like I fell in love with pie because I I got there and I was like, whoa. (laughs) <laughs> whoa i mean he was definitely driving a ferrari i got there and and i was like oh he's super cute and of course he was super personable and then you get on him and it is very much like driving the ferrari so i took the ferrari home and i tried to take it four-wheeling <laughs> <laughs> okay so that yeah pretty is as pretty does so, but then there are people you know i have to say that there are people who maybe ride you know in western pleasure or they show you know paints they do specific breed classes where color is important well, so i can understand different. that there are some people who are immersed in those worlds where where coat color and pattern would be kind of important i did but, the same thing i bought a uh, hackney pony and i was a, i was a more experienced driver at that point but I bought a hackney pony and boy that pony almost uh, we almost had a few, many accidents because <laughs> it was like driving a Ferrari uh, you know I, I'm not sure I was because he was cute that's the reason I bought him um, so I've made that mistake isn't that why you married your wife too <laughs> yeah Jennifer wouldn't ride with me in the cart with that pony she said oh, that's too dangerous I'm not doing it I'm not getting in there <laughs> <laughs> so, number 10, not considering the time and expense of horse care. Well, I think that's pretty much given. We've talked about that one in the past, obviously. The most expensive part of buying a horse is not buying the horse. Uh, that's the cheapest part of buying a horse. So, yes. we've talked about that one. Well, that's that's cool. Well, those are the top 10. That was put out by about, about.com. Catherine Blockensdorf wrote that. And uh, so, I thought it would be fun to talk about with Lena today. And that's a wrap. To listen to more tips, just go to horsetipdaily.com and look for the topics drop-down menu on your left. If you love listening to the Stable Scoop crew putting in their two cents on everything horse, you can tune in every week at stablescoop.com for great interviews with fascinating folks from around the horse universe. And don't forget to support our sponsors here on Horse Tip Daily because they make these podcasts possible. Today's podcast has brought to you been brought to you through the generous support of equestriancollections.com. The Horse Radio Network and the Horse Radio Network hosts are not responsible for statements of guests or their opinions. Use your own judgment when listening to the tips provided by the experts on Horse Tip Daily. 